The PC Engine, the TurboGrafx-16. I don't know what to call it, and neither did its creators. It was big in Japan as the PC Engine, not quite as big in the US as the TurboGrafx, though big enough to catch the attention of a young Kanye West. And here in the UK, well, it was a virtual no-show. What with the upcoming launch of the PC Turbo Engine Mini, whatever you want to call it, I thought the time was ripe to have a look at a few of the games that showed what this often underrated system could do when pushed to the limit. Some of these games we'll be seeing again on the Mini in the coming months, and well, some of them we won't, at least not officially. All of them do though give the hardware a good workout, and maybe show why this system has such a cult following. One that is certainly on the roster, and how could it be left off? It's Blazing Lasers, aka Gunhead. Like the console itself, and nearly every game on this list, it has a bit of an identity crisis, but it doesn't much matter what you call it, because this is an absolutely storming game. On its release in 1989, it was probably not just the best vertical scroller you could get on the Turbo Graphics, but pretty much the best on any home system. Yes, it is better than Hybris on the Amiga Shock Horror, it's that good. Lots and lots of action, tons of sprites all whizzing around as sprites do, with rock solid frame rates and minimal flicker, not a given even on this system. That, mixed with a good dose of the top quality pixel art you expect from Japanese shooters of this era, make it pretty special. No surprise really, as creators compile were, at this point, absolute masters of the shooter. In fact, the only real clue that you're not playing on an arcade machine is the rather moderate difficulty curve. Yeah, it gets tough later on, but this is refreshingly easy to get into. Now, of course, this being a fairly early title, later games did supersede it purely in the tech department, but, well, not by all that much. Yes, it looks and plays superb, a canonical classic of the genre and Kanye's favourite TG16 title, a man of taste and refinement, clearly. Yes, shooters, shooters, shooters. The turbo engine, as I'm calling it for the moment, was stuffed full of them. The console choice of connoisseurs of this genre. And time now for another one. One that goes in the other direction. It's Magical Chase. A cute em up shooter that's got more depth than its kiddie, cartoony, cuddly, light-hearted looks would suggest. A holy grail in collector's circles, this is a game like Little Samson that is both very rare and very good, pushing the prices well up into the that's it, I'm taking the kids territory. You might be tempted to write this one off as another impenetrable Japanese Majoko manga thing, but it's not. This really is a very solid shooter with an interesting power-up system, some superb level design and some memorable bosses. It runs like an absolute dream too, as much if not more going on as Gradius, but without the irritating slowdown spoiling the fun. Developers Quest weren't experienced in this field, but they seem to be somehow channeling the skills of the best in the business here, coaxing this off-white wonder box into doing some great things. This game's greatest trick though, surely has to be its multiplane parallax scrolling. Yes, they said it was impossible, or at least Tecmo did with Ninja Gaiden, but if the C64 can do it well, the turbo engine can too surely, as this proves. Yes, it lacked the multiple hardware background layers of other consoles, but pulling it off was possible. And not just split scrolling, but different layers on the same scanline, a feat that very few other games here ever managed. Tragically, this is not included on the new mini console, a bit of a disappointment, and given its insane rarity and subsequent notoriety, a bit of a surprise they didn't put it in. OK, time to move away from shooters now into the world of fighters. And how could we escape it when we're talking about gaming in the 90s? Yes, it's Street Fighter 2, the champion edition to be precise. 
a game that was ported to absolutely everything that could possibly run it way back then, and a lot of stuff that couldn't. Yes, a real test of a system's metal, dividing them pretty solidly into the coulds and the couldn'ts. The Spectrum couldn't, neither could the C64. The Amiga might have been able to, though not in the hands of US Gold. But the turbo engine, well, it could. The visuals alone should tell you that this is a very solid port, maybe even the best console port you could get at the moment of its release. More colourful than the Megasys, more featureful than the World Warrior port on the Super NES. All the fun of the Champion Edition Fair, Boxer, Claw, Dictator and Yulebrinner all fully playable of course. The huge sprites, detailed backgrounds and fluid animation may be not totally arcade accurate, but more than close enough to make this a very impressive cube card. Yeah, you're going to need the optional six button pad to really get the best out of it and maybe a multi-tap too for two player action. But hardware requirements aside, this is a pretty darn good port all round, with the possible exception of the music, which, well, could be better. The only rough spot here, a game that a lot of systems struggled with, but not this one. As we move on, we're going to be leaving cartridges behind and taking a look at a bit of a lost Castlevania classic and a bit of a CD-ROM showpiece. Yes, just, well, let's not get bogged down in the Japanese name and just call it Castlevania Rondo of Blood. The turbo engine, or I think actually for brevity's sake, Neville, is what I'm going to call it now. It was the first console ever to use CD-ROMs, and in fact one of the very first consumer products to use this technology in any form. Unlike the largely ill-fated add-ons from other companies, this was a big success. A good chunk of the library coming on these silvery discs, and with games like this one, well, it's easy to see why. One of the finest in the classic Castlevania series, hell, maybe even the best by some reckonings, it certainly deserves to be remembered as one of Konami's top moments in this era. A white knuckle ride through every horror trope in the book, a world loaded with lumbering eldritch horrors, where even the great outdoors is lit by candlelight, and yet your greatest foes are still birds and stairs. The difficulty is tempered by infinite continues and a save system, thankfully, but it's still, well, like what you would expect from classic Castlevania, a bit of a challenge, though none the worse for it. As a game, it's definitely got it, but as an all-round audio-visual experience, it's got it too. The best Konami could give us until Symphony of the Night. Music, art and visual effects that I don't think were really overtaken until the world went 32-bit. Neville's specs may have meant that he was one of the weakest of the big three fourth generation consoles in many respects, but here it shows that he was still hard to beat. High res and very colourful, this may lack the scaling effects of Castlevania 4, but otherwise I think it leaves it well behind in sheer graphical pop, and bloodlines on the old Megasys 2 for that matter. Yes, Neville had the wind up his tail for this one. Sensibly, Konami have included this on the upcoming Neville Jr., but only the original Japanese version. Why? Well, I don't know. Translated versions, both official and unofficial, do definitely exist. It appeared on the Virtual Console in English, but for whatever reason, it's Japanese only this time, folks. Not that we're really missing much in the way of a subtly crafted plot. One of the Belmont clan fights a Dracula. The end is the basic thrust of this, and of course every other Castlevania game. Story never was the main draw, and still definitely one to look forward to. Now onto a game that we won't be seeing again on the mini, but one that's worth a quick tour of anyway. It's Ryuko no Ken, also known as Art of Fighting in its West. Guys. As the importance of the fighting game grew and grew in the 90s, Neville co-parent Hudson Soft thought it might be a good idea to feed him with some of that increasingly popular fisticuffs fodder, lest their small grey cuboid son be left behind. 
This, along with a small gaggle of SNK titles, making the jump to the CD-ROM system, thanks to Hudson Soft's involvement, and all of them, well, pretty spiffy. Now this here title is maybe not absolutely the most enjoyable of the bunch that was squeezed in, but it may well be the most technically impressive. Yes, this started life as a Neo Geo game, the old unbeatable 16-bit howitzer, but this game has survived surprisingly well through the conversion. It's got most of what you would expect from a 90s one-on-one -on -one basher, enormous hulking yet well-animated characters, colourful backgrounds, lots of rich grunty sound effects too, all running mostly without a frame hitch. The only real rough spot in the visuals is that slightly, well actually very jarring zoom effect when the characters draw together. Yes, it is supposed to be like that, not just a glitch, an attempt to emulate the much better executed dramatic zoom on this and many other Neo Geo fighting games. It's not great, but at least they gave it a go, showing just how much enthusiasm went into this conversion. I'm sure that there are some rare breed fighting game aficionados that would disagree, but despite this game's artistic pow, well, it's just not as much fun as Street Fighter 2. On the other hand though, it does look quite amazing, giving the Super NES and the Mega Sys versions of this game some very serious competition. Along with Street Fighter 2, this won't be appearing on the Mini, to be expected though I suppose, both Capcom and SNK still keeping fairly tight control of their fighting game licenses. And to be fair, good games as they are, if you want to play these games today, well there are better ways than the nicely done but cut down Neville ports. Now back to the world of shooters, the sphere where Neville was cock of the walk for a good while, and a title that was, well, arguably the best looking and most technically dazzling game this system could serve up. It is, of course, Ginga Fuke Densetsu Sapphire, or in English, Galaxy Police Legend Sapphire. A game that chucks absolutely everything it can at the screen. A wildly ambitious blast of missile slinging action that seems determined to wind it up to the very highest notch possible on what was, by this point, a system that was getting a bit creaky. You could argue that there are better games out there, Compile or Naxat Soft could maybe give you more of a good time, but without quite the same ornamental verve. Released a full year after the debut of the PlayStation, it still somehow looked state-of-the-art. A CD-ROM title that really made use of the extra storage space and improved sound. This game is dense with audio-visual detail and variety that you would never see on a cartridge. Along with the high frame rate sprite explosion gameplay, it throws up so many superb graphical tricks and digital filigrees, it's hard to keep track of them all. The huge pre-rendered polygonal sprites, the weird morphing holograms, the sumptuous backgrounds, the giant bullet belching bosses, a 2D shooter eye candy conveyor belt that keeps bringing graphical goodies. Purists may note that this game does require the arcade system card to run, yes an upgrade to an add-on, but even that brings only extra RAM, bumping it up to just over 2MB. Unlike say the Sega CD, here there are no extra processors or graphics upgrades, just that extra storage space. What we're looking at here is simply that original chipset being pushed very, very hard, to the limits, in fact, of all the systems of this vintage, remember it came out in 1987, it's tough to think of any one that came up with anything better. Not the last game released before Neville met his end, but the last really notable one. It will thankfully be there on his minute reincarnation though, the first time this game will officially be available to Western gamers, and not before time.
Yes, that is the end of our tour for now. The PC Engine, the Turbo Graphics, whatever it is you want to call it, it is a fantastic piece of hardware with some amazing games. Well, it finally gets the recognition it so richly deserves with the reissue of the upcoming mini console. Well, who knows? It is now in the hands of Konami. Maybe they'll do a better job than NEC did way back then. It's certainly got a good lineup of games. Will it turn out to be an NES classic or will it be more of a disappointing PlayStation classic? Well, time will tell. That is it for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Yeah, I can't say Konami. Konami? Konami? I don't. I can't say it. I've tried, so don't leave comments. I've done my best. I can't make that word sound good.